And, and my view is that, that we're, we're really now facing some irreversible changes uh, how we work. So there's no, there's no going back to March 2020 is, is my central thesis. This is Straight Talk in the COVID Economy, and my name is Larry Quick. Our world has changed and there's no going back. The COVID economy is now very real. We are adapting to telework, Zooming, online learning and new industries like PanSafe and other opportunities revealed by COVID-19. The challenges are also with us. Bankruptcies, unemployment, debt and confusion. In Straight Talk in the COVID Economy, we meet thinkers and innovators who bring insight and information into the opportunities and risks of our rapidly emerging COVID economy. Straight Talk in the COVID Economy is brought to you by Resilient Futures. This is alongside our partner, Impact Africa Network. Impact Africa Network is a non-profit startup studio in Nairobi on a mission to ensure young, talented Africans have a chance at participating in the digital transformation of Africa as creators and owners. If grassroots change is something that excites you, visit www.impactafrica.network. By doing that, you'll be able to support as donors and mentors the Impact Africa Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Straight Talk in the COVID Economy. Uh, I have a particularly special guest today, Mark Zawacki. Um, I, I bumped into Mark in Australia some years ago, and we shared a lift to the airport, and then we've caught up a few times in uh, the Valley in San Francisco. And I've always found his work really fascinating. And when uh, COVID-19 hit, and we started to think about, well, COVID-19 is going to be here for a while, the new COVID uh, normal is going to happen. That changes a whole bunch of things. It changes how we work, how our organisations are, are constructed or, or organised. There's a whole range of things that have changed. What Mark has come up with is a, a, a theory that we're going to go through today. Well, it's more than a theory. I think it's, it's a reality, the diffusion of everything. Um, so Mark's here with us. Now, just quickly, I'm really disappointed with Mark very disappointed because his subline or uh, to the uh, diffusion of everything is no more $14 avocado on toast. Now I'm shocked by that, Mark. Please explain. Well, it's, a, it's an inside joke. If you'd been to Silicon Valley in the last couple of years, you noticed the spiraling cost of avocado on toast. It, it was the height of the bubble. Uh, I think prior we would watch the price of uh, the Herman Miller Arion chairs. And in this bubble, we're watching the price of avocado on toast escalate. So it's a bit of an inside joke that we're extracting extreme amounts of value from, uh, from people just wanting their morning avocado on toast. Well, I've just invested quite a lot of money in the $14 avocado proprietary limit or limited company on the NASDAQ. So I think, I guess I've lost all my cash there. So, so to move on, um, Mark uh, runs a strategic advisory organization called 650 Labs. And if you go to 650labs.com, that's 650labs.com, you'll see what it's all about. Uh, now, Mark, since 2001, has advised executives uh, from leading multinational organizations across the world in a variety of sectors. That includes AMP, it includes Commonwealth Bank, uh, it includes ComBank uh, and the wealth management side of CBA and the NRMA and quite a few more. Uh, he provides counsel at the uh, he provides counsel at the intersection of strategy and growth, corporate innovation and organisational change. So you can see that it's a whole package that uh, Mark does. And if you want to know anything about what's happening in Silicon Valley, Mark's the person to talk to. That's, that's what I've found, and I can remember having a conversation with Mark where he said something very simple but very extraordinary some time ago, which is just played out time and time again, uh, and I've dined out on, that um, the big thing in Silicon Valley is not necessarily just about technology, it's about business model um, uh, innovation. And uh, I, I think that's a pretty startling um, uh, uh, understanding some years ago now that a lot of organizations don't get. They adopt technology, they digitize and all this sort of stuff, and they just think they can carry on with the old business model. Not the case, particularly since COVID 
has hit us and we have COVID normal and into a COVID economy. So um, Mark's paper um, states historically commercial activities were largely clustered in urban areas. I think we can all relate to that. And organisations themselves were successful by efficiently concentrating assets, power and resources. These notions are being diffused, distributed and radically configured. Remote work from home and hybrid is the future. So what does it mean for employees, business and society? Mark, first question, and you've actually put this question to me. How do we identify, attract, hire, coach and motivate employees in this particular type of environment in the future? You know, by, by a show of hands, who wants to work from their lounge or, you know, sit in their boxers at the end of their bed the rest of their life? Uh, I don't think anybody signed up for that uh, as a start. I think, you know, we, in large organizations, we have a, a challenging enough time managing people there in front of us. Um, COVID is, is a game changer. How do we manage people in a, in a virtual environment? You know, how do you get on the right project? How do you have a, a pint or a cuppa with, you know, the boss and try to figure out where you're at in the promotion cycle? How do you, you know, how do you, you know, go out, go out for lunch with the mates and just figure out what's going on in, in their part of the, and, and my view is that, that we're, we're really now facing some irreversible changes uh, how we work. So, you know, how we manage people, how we get promoted in organizations, uh, that's all uh, now in, in uncharted territory. So th there's, no, there's no going back to March 2020 is, is my central thesis. Um, and how, how, do I, how do I unpack that? Um, we've been doing this for six months. People are getting comfortable. They're, they're productive for the most part. Yes, we miss our mates. We miss the the, um, the, the interaction, we're social animals, you know, the office provided a, a socialization during our, our, our work week that was enjoyable. Um, but organizations have figured out that, that they can work in remote ways, they can work in, in hybrid ways. There's some uh, tremendous efficiencies, efficiencies to be gained by that. So it's, it's, dare I use the phrase, it is the new normal. Yeah, we found that um, somewhere between 25% to 45%, and it, I don't think it's absolute either, that they're all going to work from home um, and, and not go to the office. I think there's a large amount that can uh, work outside the office permanently and where they're organised to do it that way. But it's definitely a larger percentage that are going to be doing, say, three days or two days at the office and three days at, um, uh, and I'm not too sure it's all at home or at remote hubs or um, uh, workspaces um, in a, in, from an Australian perspective. But I wonder, in your view, you talk about a hybrid between the two. Is that sort of like that's work from home, work from office, work from cafe? Work, how are you seeing that? Yeah, I, I, I want to make a distinction between hybrid and remote. Uh, the five day, nine to five work week, I believe is, is a thing of the past. It's dead and it's not coming back um, for, for maybe half the workforce. As you said, maybe it's 25 to 45%, maybe it's 50%, but for fully, you know, let's say half the workforce, it's, it's no longer nine to five. That forks into two places. One is it's a hybrid model. You still need to live within reasonable distance of the city center, the CBD. So you might live in Hawthorne, you might live in Preston, and you're gonna go in two to three days a week and you're gonna stay home and, and work uh, uh, in a hybrid model two, days, uh, two to three days a week you know, at your residence or at, at somewhere much closer to Hawthorne or Preston than, than going into the Melbourne CBD or, you know, Use the analogy for Sydney. If you're up in in uh, Saint Ives, you're somewhere like that, or eastern suburbs. Yeah. Now, remote says you may live interstate. Remote says you know you you're, you're going to go live up in Gold Coast. You're going to you know live in WA, or you're going to be much farther away. And remote says you may only come in, 
you know, once every two months, once every quarter, uh, you know, four times a year, maybe six times a year. So I think when we talk about not coming into the office, we need to be clear on some definitions around the world. Do you mean hybrid where I still come in a couple of days a week and I probably still need to live in, you know, within striking distance of the, of the CBD? Or do you mean truly remote where I can live interstate or if I'm in Europe, I live in, you know, another country. Um, I may still be in the same time zone, right? I can go live in Chamonix, but, but I'm, I'm working for a company up in Copenhagen. And do you see, um, uh, business models um, uh, changing in this diffusion of, of work place almost. We, we see, um, uh, you know, like our organisation, we have a small office in a place called Wood End, little village north of Melbourne. Uh, we have four people, five people working in a little office who could quite easily work from home. They have worked from home, but they tend to come into the office but then there's another five to eight people all over the place. And uh, the, um, we've been doing that for years. And I, I wonder if it's the technology is there for organisations like us, a small, you know, small medium enterprise, um, and we can, we can have people in other parts of Australia, other parts of the world, etc. And we're okay with that. Uh, I wonder if what COVID has done is given permission to large organisations to do it themselves. I mean, work from home has been around for years and everyone was going into one day or two days work from home and organisations weren't necessarily changing their footprint, their sort of physical footprint. But now what we have is permission. It's almost like, bang, it's happened. Permission. Permission to buy online. Permission to work from home. All of those things have actually just exploded everything that is to do with diffusion or fragmenting things. So you're, you're right. The, 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 the permission wasn't there prior. Yeah. I don't think large companies really trusted their employees. They still had no. these command and control architectures. They had to check up on their people. They had to know what they were doing. It sounds very quaint and very old fashioned, but the reality is a lot of large multinationals around the world still managed with these top down architectures that said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stand on my people's heads and, and make sure they get the work done every week. And what COVID has done is it's, it's upended that fundamental dated uh, industrial age management uh, uh, edict or that management approach. And suddenly the businesses are running and they're flourishing and we don't have to spy on our people and, and make sure they're rocking up every day, getting the job done. They are. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, how does this change business models? You know, when we have been working from home, you know, part time for, for, for certainly decades now, the, the, the business models, I think that we could see change could even be more profound than that. You know, what, what opportunities present itself if you can lay, if you can lower, you know, your global workforce uh, uh, labor bill by 30%, you know, suddenly we don't have to bring everyone into an urban area. They don't even have to be in Australia, right? We've, we've been outsourcing to India for, you know, for decades as well. That's a 30 year old trend, give or take, you know, we've been doing that since, you know, roughly 1990, that really took off. But, but what does it mean when we fundamentally rethink not only the IT outsourcing bit, but every part of our business, and they, it can be done anywhere in the world. I think that could be a profound change to our business model. Yeah, we're seeing that um, happen now. And it's sort of, uh, for us, there's two industries that we see becoming, um, you know, have been given permission. And I, I, cause I don't think it's like, well, now we can do it. It's like we needed, large organizations needed permission to do it and the the um the the um the work from home uh, activity has generated um and we've seen this in previous studies we've done people working from home that local community they work in is enriched by the money they then spend in the local community and it's, it's two thirds of their working week three days at the office and two days at home it is significant the other side of it is that um, people, as you say, don't have to work 
locally, they can work globally. So that from an employment perspective is saying, what are you good at in San Francisco where you can work in Melbourne without sure. necessarily leaving San Francisco? And uh, I, I know from us, our perspective, we do, we've thought that way for a long time, but it's giving large organisation permission to do it. I think the other thing is that what we're seeing is how do you support those people who are working from home? If they're contractors, that's up to them, but if they're employees, how do you support them? That's a whole industry in that. You know, the tele yeah, and there's, tele work there's, industry. And there's regulatory issues. There will be regulatory issues around that if yep. they're proper employees and how they're looked after. But what you're what you're now digging on, Larry, is kind of a kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, what I'd ask everyone listening now to to watch out for is: Are we going to hit a tipping point? And the the tipping point, I believe, uh, could play out like this: More and more companies seem to be jumping on the bandwagon to say we're going to be a remote culture, right? So I, I watch companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, Google and and Facebook, uh, they both said, we're not going to open our offices until August 2021, another year away. Uh, we're not even opening our offices until then. And then I see companies like in, in Germany, Siemens, 380,000 employees saying they're going to adopt uh, a remote first policy. I think they mean hybrid but the, the, the headline is remote first. So what I'd ask your, 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 you know, the listeners today to look out for is a tipping point. If enough large companies around the world begin adopting this remote first or even hybrid first model, my thesis is it becomes a standard benefit and everyone's got to do it to stay competitive in the marketplace, yes. right? And that tipping point could happen pretty quick. If 20 or 30 percent of large AXS listed companies decided to offer remote working policies to, to half their staff, those other 50 percent of AXS listed companies are going to have to adopt the, the same policies just to attract good talent. Yeah. So that's, that's, one, that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, and, and something to watch out for, and, and it's a big, big question mark in my mind, is can we be as effective, can we get things done if, if, um, if we're remote in terms of culture? You know, the, I, I, I give you this um, analogy of, of, um, of Silicon Valley. It's, it's, it's done remarkable things in the last 30 years. It's created all these giant, giant companies. I would argue organizationally that it's 80% good and 20% caustic. You know, 20% of what he does is absolutely horrible, but 80% but is largely good because it's trial and error. You know, it tries some bits, it doesn't work, so it, it modifies it. But how it's evolved, you know, how we manage people, right? There's, there's shelf feet of books written about Google and Apple and Facebook in terms of organizationally, right? They've taken this theory X and theory Y uh, and, and, and pushed out the theory Y really, really far, you know, autonomous teams and flat organizations and empowerment. It really has grokked those organizational theories of 30 years ago into workable organizational designs. But, but it's 80, 20, 80% 80 really worked well, 20% has been absolutely horrific and, and terrible, but that's, that's the cost of experimentation. My point is, just a few years ago, Google was redesigning its corporate campus that, that everything was gonna be serendipity and we we're gonna have these natural collisions, that no two offices were gonna be four uh, uh, minutes apart and, and everyone walked through a common area. And I'm just bumping into people and you know, the serendipitous nature of, of natural collisions. Now what happens? You, you know, they, they, they held that to, their, to their, their core being, you know, smash a bunch of people together in a very tight, you know, uni-style dormitory environment. And, 
and, and just that they're, they're so cl closely co-located together, a lot of magic will happen. So yeah. the flip side of all this remote and, and hybrid stuff is, can organizations continue to evolve? Now, I, I just read an article t less than 24 hours ago and the new, well, not so new, a couple of years ago, but Sundar Pichai, which runs Alphabet, the parent company, he was given the reins by, by, by obviously uh, Sergey and Larry, He's taken the he's he's taken the uh, the word to have an off site, and now what Google is saying for later in 2021 and 2022, we're designing company on sites. So they're flipping the whole mentality. How do we design work so we have on sites? We actually come on to campus in a very orchestrated way to have the kinds of meetings, productive meetings we need to have. And then we can go back home and, and, and work in that hybrid like environment. So, you know, they're turning that off site logic on its head and they're now, they're now designing for on sites. And I just, you know, you could, you could play that out. Maybe certain functions come in on certain days, certain teams come in on certain days, certain, you know, uh, leadership hierarchies come on, come in on certain days. So they're trying to orchestrate coming into the office, you know, on sites, Versus the old offsite, off -site. you know, somewhere fancy and fun, and get out of the office for a few days. That's interesting. I think the um, uh, it, it's. Um, I, I know that we work um, on time and task with um, uh, some of our outsourced people and contract. So it's you have to do this, uh, and that's the amount of time that's agreed to do it. And there's a start and there's a finish to it. And there might be some, uh, some other remedial work gets done along the way with whatever gets produced. But generally speaking, there's time and task. And there's a certain relationship you have with those people at a time and task. Uh, and then there's people who are working as if they're working in an office where they start uh, maybe, it depends on where they are, but they might start at their 7 a.m. in the morning, work through the noon, then have a break and then do a few hours in the afternoon. We don't necessarily care. So it's what your idea of diffusion, it's, it's like in every part, every, it's cellular almost. That if you look at an offsite is cellular, is diffused. An onsite, what doesn't, where is the site? This is one of the things you could start to ask yourself. Is it on the campus or is it, that, you know, we're going to do it somewhere else. You know, we're going to, when we are able to travel and do all that, where will the on-site be? Look, I think the on-site would be, will, here's an idea. Instead of having one office for 200 people in the CBD, maybe you have four offices of, of 50 people and they're just spread out, right? Yeah. It shortens everyone's commute. It, 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 diff, it diffuses and flattens. And I think our, 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 the core of our cities shrink a bit. I, I just saw research out of Australia in the last 72 hours that talked about this, right? Yep. What if occupancy levels dropped by, I think the number is 40 or 50%, yep. you know, some, some planners are expecting. And I think that's going to diffuse. And so, you know, in, in, in Sydney, if you had a big, you know, 200 person office in the CBD, maybe you've got a 40 person office in the, you know, in the Eastern suburbs and a 40 person office in the uh, Northern beaches and a 40 person office in the, you know, inner West or even farther out. Uh, and then, uh, you know, something, something in Wollongong or something, you know, you, you know, kind of spreads out. And even then you're not coming in five days a week. You might be coming in a couple of days a week. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, a good mate of mine works for a, an international company. They have an office in London in uh, near Finsbury Square. And that office has about 200 people in it. And recently their, their, uh, uh, their landlord, their commercial landlord in London said, new rules when you come back, you have to reduce head count by 50%. You can only enter the building between eight and half eight because we're going to organize every single tenant to come in at a certain time. So you can only come in between eight and half eight. You can only leave between half five and six. 
and you can't leave during the day and there's no guests. But that, that's, those are the constraints that a, that a yeah. London, uh, uh, you know, uh, a state agent, a commercial uh, uh, landlord is, is the restrictions they're putting on a, a, a space in London. And the MD said, are you trying to chase us out? How, how, do you even make, how do you even make the economics work with, with half the headcount in there? Well, how do you make the economics work if you're only charging? Oh, well, if, you, if they're going to keep the space, because if you've got, you know, a couple of floors, do you need two floors or just one floor? Right. I, I think the, um, uh, the, you've, when you're thinking about a whole system, as we look at value networks, sure. as, you know, not value chains, value networks, because everything's connected to everything else. And the capability that we have these days is mostly outsourced. So, you know, we do very, very small pieces. Or as an organisation, an organisation does small pieces but actually has all the outsourced capabilities, whether it's utilities, <coughs> excuse me, or if it's um, sometimes security services, sometimes it's like oh, we do our researches over here or whatever it might be. And in Australia particularly, basically that we're fluid because we're a service-based, apart from mining and maybe, well, education is a service-based industry and that's another that's a whole other story. But as sure. a service-based economy, um, you, um, uh, don't, you're very, it's very fluid and diffused. When you look for the outside, um, in your outside network, they're all diffused as well. So by changing your business model, you're changing your business model. All of a sudden, a real estate agent says, no, this is the new rules for my business model. And then someone says to him, no, this is our rules for your business model. So there's this huge instability in the value network as it sorts itself out. So diffusion is not a concept of, um, well, it just goes boom like that. It goes boom, 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 and feeds back on itself until it gets some sort of equilibrium and sort of starts to stabilise. Because I like, like, particularly our, we, we call it the, um, the um, square metre economy. The square metre economy has been in yeah. place for hundreds of years because we did not have uh, the, we've started since the 90s to get a digital economy going. But all of a sudden there's been what we call this sort of uh, digital uh, acceleration to saturation happen. And all of a sudden, and you got permission. So that's like, Headcount down. Um, we don't. Ha we can have an excuse almost for headcount changing, but that all automatically, to your point of bringing costs down, that's going to go through the whole of the um, uh, whole of industries. And I, 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 your your point here, you've talked about the fusion of cities, talent teams, multinational, Silicon Valley, venture capital, all the way up to fintechs and banking. It's a total diffusion you're talking about. The, the, I look at the exodus in, in a place like San Francisco, and I, I see vacancies in apartment buildings going up to 40, 50% right now. You know, people are just, they're leaving. If you're under 30, you don't have much savings. You go home and live with mom and dad somewhere in the U.S. Maybe it's not even California. If in your 30s and 40s and you still have a job and your company says go work remote, well, you move to Denver or Austin or Chicago and get on the property ladder for a fourth the price, right? You can buy a hell of a lot more home in Denver for a lot, for a lot more right. home, a lot less price. And so if you're in your 30s or 40s, you're out of there. And if you're in your 50s, the, the numbers are coming in over the last six months and they're buying two or three hours away in Tahoe and Napa and Carmel. You know, that's, that's diffusion. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my one of my mates, he employs 50 people in San Francisco. And he says, look, we're going to go to a hybrid model. And but what I'm going to do, what I want to do is I want to find another 50 person company. And we'll just split the office down the middle. I'll take up Monday, Wednesday. They can have it Tuesdays, Thursdays. And we'll, we'll work out what to do on Fridays. And I thought that was pretty clever as well. Yeah. Right. We'll we'll figure out a cadence, and which, by the way, just exactly halves the real estate requirements, right? Now, remember Twitter said they're not even gonna reopen their headquarter office. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and what, so, 
So this, this diffusion, I think, is just beginning to play out. I do think it's the new normal. I think we need to separate hybrid from remote. And, and, and as, as, as this, you know, what, what got impacted? I, I like your analogy of the square meter uh, phenomenon. But this is all shoulder to shoulder businesses. What, what got hit hardest in, in COVID was any shoulder to shoulder business. That's, that's the simple way of thinking about it, right? And it was restaurants and it was uh, transport systems, <coughs> excuse me. And it was uh, offices and it was uh, sporting events. You know, it, yeah. any shoulder to shoulder business, airlines, travel, it just, it just got whacked, right? Yeah. And, and you know, if you look at um, the greater effect of that, you know, because one, one thing that America has always had it, it, it's it always uh, occurs to me that that there's there's this much good in um, Australia, there's this much bad in America. Uh, sorry, this much bad in Australia. This much good, this much bad in Australia. In America, there's this much good and this much bad. And you can go around the country and go, you know, good, bad. But, you know, America has... You know, when I lived there, it was just that my wife and I used to go, what? You know, in one hour, you can see the worst of the world. And then in that same hour, you can see the best. And I, I wonder with its, this diffusion in places like San Francisco, the Valley, um, you know, New York City, uh, how does it regroup? How does it get to stable? given particularly the social economic impact of COVID and also, say, for instance, the election that's going on now. How does it get back to stable? Let, let's, let's think it through, right? Urban areas uh, tend to have, uh, generally speaking, higher educated people that earn higher wages. Uh, they tend to be professionals. They tend to be business owners. You know, you look at the you look at the demographics of an urban area. If those people leave, who, who's holding the bag to pay taxes? You know, where where, where is the where where's the tax revenue going to come from to uh, to provide the services in these urban areas? This is a real issue right now in New York. Um, New York and San Francisco. San Francisco has, I believe, I just saw last month. It has the highest income tax uh, in the in the U.S. nationwide. When you when you look at state, uh, uh, federal, and then local taxes, you pay on like similar to a GST tax. But when you look at federal taxes, state taxes, local taxes, it's the, it's the most expensive place in the U.S. to live. And there's an exodus going on right now, and I would argue that exodus is is being driven from the top. People are relocating their businesses outside of San Francisco. Look, look this up. Wh who's gonna be holding the, the, the bag on that tax bill? What happens when, you know, if half of restaurants don't open again in San Francisco proper, somebody's made that estimate, that, that same estimate has now been made in London and Paris. Those, those, those restaurants don't have, uh, they're, they're, they're not contributing to the tax base. Wow, and that, there's a flow-on effect for that. A yeah, there's a tremendous, you know, if you want to put your systems thinking hat on, what, what happens, you yeah. know, to the, to the tax base of these cities if the, if the exodus uh, is permanent, which I believe it, it, it very well is likely to be. Yeah, and you get that, that shift. Um, it, it's interesting, the um, work we've done in telework, um, which was done 13, 2013, um, clearly showed there was a, um, a better spread of, at the end game, was a better spread of the tax base um, uh, for, well, not, sorry, the economic base, not just the tax base, but, um, and it, it did put a load on um, some of the utilities in places. So, say, for instance, up the east coast of the US, um, we did a project called um, uh, the Northeast Corridor Connects. 
And if yeah. you look at the amount of traffic that goes up the I-95 and back again and up to your, you know, wherever the rail, your Seller Express goes from Boston down to wherever, Philadelphia or somewhere, the, maybe like, uh, further down. But the, um, what, I looked at it and said, this is, what's got to happen? You've got to take transactions off the road. The transactions have got to come off the road. And if you do that uh, through digital as much as you can, then you're going to save infrastructure, you're going to save a whole bunch of stuff. But they're all sunk costs. You know, you might be able to delay now stuff, but there's a whole bunch of roads that are built. So uh, so the issue is from a tax perspective is the, the, um, the tax uh, or the utilities are spent in the local community. But, you know, the business taxes that are there, because you're working from home, it's not like you're a business. The business tax is paid if it's whatever's left is paid in the um, in the place where you're you're, you're being employed. So, right. Yeah. So it's it's a diffusion of a tax base is what I'm getting at because it's absolutely. So thought, what about because you guys have got federal, state, local taxes? We tend to have local rates for local local um, for business and for um, uh, for domestic uh, residential, um, but. We all, we then have PAYE and GST uh, national, and that's, right. that's relatively stable state. But in America, the the diffusion of the tax, and when you would say if a um, thousand people who weren't working in a local community all of a sudden are working from home, they spend more money, but they don't pay any tax for the utilities they're then working with because you know, water, sewerage, electric, all of that is now located five days a week at home. So it, 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 it's a, so, such a diffusing situation with the tax and cost base uh, so from a I'm, local economic perspective. I'm already seeing, it's related to this concept, Larry, I'm already seeing Silicon Valley companies say, if you stay with the company but move elsewhere, we reserve the right to lower your wages. Wow. And so a good mate of mine is a executive at a very well-known tech company in Silicon Valley. It has a blue logo. I won't say too much, but it has a blue logo. And he relocated from San Francisco to Chicago. They gave him about a 10% haircut on his wages, but he kept his equity and he kept his variable pay. Uh, the bonus scheme yes, state, um, and he goes, I'll take that. That's, that's brilliant. I, I, I can buy more property for, for my money in Chicago. He happens to be from Chicago, but I can buy more money, uh, more property. That, that's a, that's a fair trade. No problem. And, and a similar example is I heard of somebody moving recently from a very well-known Palo Alto company, um, not Facebook, uh, but a very well-known Palo Alto company uh, to Denver, and they were told they were going to get an 18% uh, uh, downward pay adjustment. Wow. Uh, and they said, also, oh, that's, a, that's a great deal. So I think until, this, until we figure this out, there's going to be some, some labor arbitrage. There are going to be people trying to game the system and, and, and move to a low tax because we have different tax rates by state. State yep. of Nevada uh, has no tax, no state tax. That's why wealthy Californians live just across the border in Nevada because they pay no state tax in a place like Incline Village. It's famous for tax exiles from California to reside there. Uh, and, and I think people will be gaming that. So they have, you know, they have the, uh, the, the gambling revenue to, to, to mean they don't need to uh, have a state tax. Uh, same goes for Alaska. They have oil revenues. There's a no state tax in, in Alaska. So people will start playing that arbitrage game. Where can they move to uh, maximize utility, maximize their own personal spending at the expense of their company? If their company offers, you know, a, a true remote uh, work plan. Wow. So um, the knock-on effect of what we're talking about from a diffusion perspective and I, I, I think it's it's been happening, but it's sort of like to, to look look at what are the industries you'd invest in, um, yeah. what what 
what would you start right now? I mean, I, 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 for instance, I think a uh, remote work support industry would be, sure, a, sure. you know, and, and if they can do a, um, uh, a, a transfer or transition training from barista to trans, uh, remote working support industry, you know, um, or um, the other thing that we're seeing is uh, tele-services is that um, you, you had a, say, for instance, a, uh, and there are some of these already existing based on pre-permission, COVID permission times, where you were doing online psychology to a, a, a small group. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, there's um, a shortage of m mental health workers uh, who can now work online and they can go anywhere in the world and, uh, you know, the, um, uh, and specialise in certain ways. Um, we're also seeing the uh, tele-service or an online service in some types of, um, of, um, um, of surgery where you, you don't necessarily have the surgical instruments. You know, it's not like automated, you know, you, you, you can do that. They're out of Ireland, they're doing that sort of thing, but, you know, running the machine. Um, you know, I had, I had a, um, a two heart operations one time and I went into the theatre and they laid me on the table and I was there and they had a few people around me and they had this room up there with glass behind it and there were all these people in, one guy had a tie on, one had a white shirt on and I, then I saw my doctor up in there and he came down and he goes, oh, and he goes, what's the room up there? And he goes, oh, that's where we actually do the operation from because it's done to, you know, localised here. And we give advice and they give it. It's like, well, I could be in my local village doing that if you had the resources. So this tele-service diffusion that I'm seeing is like, as I say in Australia, it's very, very hard to get a mental health service because the, the mental health outcomes of COVID have been pretty tragic. So, you know, this tele-service anywhere in the world, if you think about it, anything that can be digitised and even uh, physicalized in terms of uh, what is at the moment, oh, you have to go. I mean, we're now, you know, you've lived, you've lived in Australia. We're now, believe it or not, only now able to, our do local doctor gets paid for telemedicine. Right. So I think, you know, to your earlier question, where would you look for opportunities? I, I, would, I would build a simple framework to say, any shoulder to shoulder business, and then combined with that, any support infrastructure that goes underneath those shoulder to shoulder businesses, all that's up for grabs. Um, in the last two months, Google announced that they're going after universities globally. Yep. And you know, I, I posted something on LinkedIn and, and it, um, it went viral. I got over 30,000 views and I got a you know, couple hundred comments I got, uh, uh, I don't know, 50 plus shares, you know, it, it went viral. And I, 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 did, uh, I did CC a lot of business school deans that I know throughout the world. So the Dean of London Business School, the Dean of INSEAD, the Dean of Stanford. And I brought their attention to this. And, you know, classic industry disruption, they, you know, they followed, they followed the Clay Christensen logic. They're like, this doesn't touch me, it's beneath me. We still offer an experience that they can't touch. So, you know, uh, Clay Christensen's uh, theory of disruptive innovation says, yeah. discount the, 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 the yeah. company as inferior, it doesn't have distribution, yeah. it doesn't have brand. Why, why worry about that little company in Seattle? They only sell books, yeah. you know. I, you know, yeah. it, I know that, you know, that was a, that was, I think one of the, most misread um, views. It's understood, right? So, hmm. but, but, but typically, inferior products, they, they come into the market with a, um, with a low-end, inferior product that the incumbent discounts. Yeah. And so these university professors are saying, oh, that's just a vote. When they looked at Google offering these, these new certificates in lieu of a university education, the, the response online from the university community was, 
They don't compete with us. We've got a beautiful campus. Our professors do research. Um, you, you know, we have community and, and you know, they, they, they have a false sense of security. I, I have this simple way of looking at disruption is an overused word, but a simple way. And I describe it to executives around the world. I say any, any large industry with, with, you know, giant pools of money that's slow to change will be relentlessly attacked, uh, you know, until, until that value shifts somewhere else. And, and yeah. that happens. That happens time and time again. It's a real simple way of thinking about this. And university education is, is the same way. It, it, you know, we have these horrifically large, uh, these horrifically expensive universities in America, and they, for the last 30 years, have the growth in, in educational expenses have outgrown uh, wages two to 3% per year for 30 years in a row. I mean, it's the, the imbalance between the cost of a, let's say an MBA and the average starting salary of an MBA graduate is completely out of whack now. Yeah. It, was, it was bad 10 years ago. It was manageable 20 years ago, yeah. but the, the universities haven't changed. And now Google is coming in and they're saying, I can teach you real practical job related skills that, that, that I'll give you certificates for. And by the way, we Google are going to accept these in lieu of a university degree. Yeah. And I, I think that's, we've been harping on that for ages, a, a yeah. long time. And I think the drama, the real drama for say Australia is that um, uh, we've relied on um, uh, a higher cost than should have been because we didn't do, didn't reorganise our physical footprints properly, and the cost of those uh, real did they need students need to be in them, and was it good for students from a cost perspective and all that to cluster around a campus and have to pay the sort of rent they have to pay to be at the campus? So there's a whole bunch of stuff around that, but the. The, um, that then in Australia, what we did was said, um, we were quite happy to um, have our universities funded by overseas students. Yeah. We always said, they're going to go, they're going to go, yeah. they're going to do it themselves at some point, or they're going to do it online, or they're going to, you know, you have to bang permission given, bang, you know, sure, it's great to come to Australia, but the cost of coming to Australia uh, and then and now, now with, and now with COVID, those business models are upside down. They can't get the students in. Exactly. Um, same same problem in the U.S. But the you know if we have any business students listening today, next time you're with a business school professor, ask them the last time they were in a business. You know, set yes. foot in a business to work. And 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 the, and the stark reality is. Very few business school professors spend time in businesses. There's a there's a disconnect. They're they're busy doing peer reviewed, you know, scientific research on a very arcane topic to yep. be published in a in a academic journal that nobody reads. The yeah. you know the Journal of Financial Economics or you know some some arcane thing, and and students the shoes finally drop. The students are saying. My business school professor knows a lot about theory, but doesn't yeah. spend a lot of practical time inside of businesses. And yeah. further, and, and so there's, there's, a, there's a big disconnect. And that disconnect uh, opens the door wide open for somebody to come in and offer practical things to do. Uh, so any any shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder business, sports and restaurants and, and higher education and the office block and all these things are going to be fundamentally rethought. And, and by the way, there's a, there's a support structure uh, underneath all of those industries that also is going to have to be figured out in the next five years. Theater, theaters and entertainment. and Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's huge. Um, uh, the, the, the instability, I don't think anyone quite gets the instability of COVID, normal COVID economy and understanding how you operate in that area uh, as a, a player uh, until it gets some sensibility about itself. Because now when you get a drop off, like we've had this sort of 
going like this and in performance and then bang uh the pass gets um is the information there is not you can't count on it anymore really it's sort of like well it worked in the past. Nah, don't worry about that what's going to work here this is going to be complex are you going to go there you're going to go there you're going to go there where are you going to go so remaining in that state of innovation flexibility you know i, I think because up to 2019 we basically killed the word innovation, you know, sure. because every organisation had their innovation. I mean, I remember talking to a bank uh, late last year in uh, uh, another state, not Victoria, and I said, so what, what is your innovation strategy? And they said, well, we've, we've been working on it for some time now, and what we've decided it's all about, it's been customer-centric. And I... Whatever that means... I, I thought, well, what have you been doing for the previous 30 years or 40? You're not, you, you think that innovation is about being customer-centric. Yeah, what does the customer need and want? It's like, well, okay, good luck with that. It took you 30 years to work that out. Yeah. You know, one of my uh, – I, I, I have lots of uh, business idols around the world, people I really admire what they've done in the business world. And uh, just sitting here talking to you, Larry, I reflected on uh, – Australia, and one of them was uh, Frank Lowy. And if you think, you know, he had a remarkable career, you know, started with nothing and, and look at the empire that he created. And love him or hate him, he was a, he was a great business yeah. guy. And he always had good timing. Now, history's going to show that he sold Center Group <laughs> at, at just the right time. I mean, clearly, Clearly the e-commerce trends and the Amazon trends and the online trends were already eating into the, you know, the shopping mall business. But, you know, first around, I guess it was around 2015, they split, you know, Westfield and Center Group into two, the domestic business and the international business. And the, the growth was in the international business. And then I think right, only about 24 months ago, just prior to COVID, they got that thing sold off to the French. Uh, <laughs> You talk yeah. about good timing. Yeah. Uh, really good timing. So, yeah, my, you know, we've been talking about shoulder to shoulder businesses. Any shoulder to shoulder business is going to be fundamentally rethought in the, in the next few years. Now, I want, to, I want to close this on a couple of ideas. Sure. Um, one is leadership. If you manage from, from the old industrial model, pyramid, top down, I got to see my people, I got to talk to my people, I'm going to stick my index finger in their chest, I'm going to sit on their head, and I'm going to tell them what to do. In this hybrid remote model, you're dead, you're gone. There, there is no way to manage in the hybrid and remote world with this industrial age managerial model. It's not going to work. And you're going to have to figure out how to get ahead of that trust your people, give them some autonomy and, 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 and allow them to flourish. Uh, so, so leadership, if you have not changed yet and, and become a digital age leader, and you still manage in this industrial age world and, and, and you believe more in uh, ascribed power versus achieved power, you're, you're done. You're not going to make it. Uh, the second big thing, we talk about innovation. I think innovation for the, for the large, for the big end of town, for the ASX listed companies is going to be exceedingly difficult in a remote or hybrid world. It's already difficult now. Um, it could be a separate, you know, we could, we could do a whole separate hour on why innovation isn't working. But the vast majority of innovation globally in, 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 in large multinationals, it's a big wank. It's Absolutely. It's it's innovation. Not agree more. They got all the buzzwords, they got all the jargon, you know, they're using all this, the, the sexy language, but they're not growing, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I could pull the numbers on AXS listed companies, and I suspect it's going to look a lot like Europe. I've got a 20 year chart, January 1st, 2000, January 1st, 2020. What are the major indices around Europe doing over that 20 year period? Over the entire 20-year period, uh, the German, the DAX 30, uh, is only moving by 5.42% uh, per annum. It gets worse. The FTSE 100 is only moving by 0.44% per annum over 20 years. 
8.42%, uh, I think, over, over the entire 20-year period. You put $100,000 January 1st, 2000 in, in a composite basket of the FTSE 100. After 20 years, you only have $108,000 out of it. Now, the, the FD is going to say, well, we paid a dividend. Yeah, 2% a year, big deal. Uh, so, so add that 2% to the 0.44%, you're getting 2.5% on your money putting it in the FTSE 100 company. And there's been negative growth on the Dutch stock exchange, on the, the Italian stock exchange, on, this, on the Spanish. They've actually shrunk over 20 years. I was talking to the head of group innovation at a big, uh, a large, rather large, well-known a uh, uh, Spanish bank, a uh, head of group innovation. He's giving give me all the sexy words about design thinking and FinTechs and CBC and all the stuff they're doing. I said, hey mate, 10 years ago, your shares were at four euros. Today they're at one euro. You've, you've lost 75% of your shareholder value in a decade and you're telling me innovation is great around here. Innovation is a means to an end. Where is it moving the needle? Where is it helping yeah. you grow? Yeah. And his response was, you gotta see the other bank. They drop more than us. <laughs> and, 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 you know, in a global economy, we can move our money where the growth is. You know, and I think the big four in Australia have to worry about that. They're all kind of anemic, you know? I, I, I know leadership at, at all four of the big banks, but are they really differentiated? Are they really growing? No, uh, no. no, they're not. Are they so we, we call that uh, the big end lock-in is that uh, we, because, sure. you know, you know, we have superannuation here. Um, yep. The baby boomers require um, a large amount of revenue growth when our interest rates are so low, you know, 0.25, whatever it is. And um, they're almost negative and, uh, right. or, or, or zero. But the, um, the, the return on, uh, superannuation demanded by the baby boomers who are, you know, just starting to come through as a as a large group, and uh, they want more for their small amount of money that they've actually put into superannuation, and you know the government uh, the cost to retirement funds it goes up makes it almost impossible from a smaller tax base to 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 give decent get retirement there, yeah. so yeah, no, we're in this sort of aging uh, breakdown um, but uh, you know the it, you know the big end is locked in to producing results quarterly that are up to the um, uh, requirements of baby boomers uh, and uh, and the financial institutions that run them so you yeah. know it's uh, the weight of money I mean, you know what we put in? We put in. Uh, forget the. Well, it's you know, it's it's ten percent. Uh, hopefully, going well. They want to go up to twelve percent um, of salaries and wages. All salaries and wages in Australia are put into superannuation, which is billions of dollars, and it's got to go somewhere. And it generally goes into um, uh, the big listed companies. And listed lock-in is um, is just there's no way that they can take time out to reinvent the organisation. So you know when uh, a Telstra or a um, uh, a NAB or a, whoever it is tries to do something, they're locked in to not make you know it's all stable state. That's what it's all based yeah. on. There's no Look, innovation in that those funds. Uh, to allow them to experiment to do what needs to be done. But that gives large opportunity to mid-sized unlisted companies, you know, even large unlisted companies, to do something. But you generally tend to, to find that they're very conservative. And no, no. The, the, the way I explain it, the, these large organizations, and sorry, we're, we're wrapping up here. We're kind of yeah. delving a little bit off the topic. We got, we're talking about innovation. Yeah. But the... There's a, there's a so-called baked-in failure. Large organizations are built for stability, reliability, predictability. They're focused on short-term quarterly results, and all the execs on the top floor are getting paid on, on that financial result. So yeah. they're, you know, their incentives are aligned to act in the short term. And that baked-in failure is 
It's structural, it's organizational, it's cultural, it's behavioral, it's financial. There, there are so many uh, headwinds against that innovation that the, the easiest way to do it, if you've been, you know, tossed the ball to carry for innovation is just do incremental bits because it's safe and you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get sacked. You're not going to get made redundant. Um, but the big transformational stuff, the big strategic stuff, it's going to come from the outside. It's, it's going to, you know, it's going to hit them, um, you know, probably where they least expect it. I was a little disappointed in the, you know, the Royal Commission report of uh, 2017, 2018. I think, you know, the banks got a, a, a pass. Uh, I think they handled, you know, with kid gloves and I wish they would have, uh, you know, cracked down a bit harder on them. But uh, I did follow that closely, uh, you know, and under full disclosure, I've got banking clients, not only in Australia, but around the world. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I guess it was kind of expected or preordained by, by some. There's an interim report, I think, that came out that kind of speculated it would be uh, handled that way. So, hey, um, so Larry, how, how did you wrap We're about out of time, mate. So we're yeah. leaving it, the, the leadership and innovation. But I'm sure there's more to be said. So we're going to have, uh, for our prime um, network members, another conversation with Mark, and uh, that that's going to give us another chance to actually get into the Mark Zawacki brain. And uh, hey. I'm looking forward to that, mate. And during really, the really, look forward, really look forward to that as well. So, Mark, thanks so much, mate. And uh, as always, I wish you could go on for longer. And you, Larry. I uh, look forward to the 17th and uh, would love to keep in touch. Anyone listening, they want to follow up on any of this, just find me online. Mark yep. Zawacki, and uh, we'd love to have a further chat to anyone that uh, finds this interesting. Mark Zawacki at 650labs.com. Well, it's, it's at Maz or Mark? Which one do you prefer? Uh, I go by either. They call me Mark. They call me Maz. So yeah, Maz, La Maz, Maz to Laz. Keep in touch. Yeah, La Maz at 650labs.com. Thanks, mate, That's and we'll speak again great. soon. Bye now. Bye. We hope you've enjoyed this Straight Talk in the COVID Economy podcast. Thank you for listening. And please subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. For more free content that will enhance your understanding of this new COVID economy and the actions that you can take to leverage disruptive change, join the Resilient Futures Network at www.resilientfutures.com slash get started. And please support our partner, Impact Africa Network at www.impactafrica.network. We need all the support we can to help them build their own incubator. We know that there are many other great podcasts out there and your time is precious and you chose to listen to Straight Talk on the COVID Economy. And we appreciate that. Thank you.